Hey everyone. So for this lecture, we're going to talk about one aspect of harmony, the chord progression. We're going to start this with how we use the chord progression today and in today's pop music especially. And then we're going to move back to its inception and kind of work our way in an abridged sort of way back to today. Now, most music plays a balancing act. We need repetition. It provides consistency and predictability. And really what it does is give us a sense of security. If there's not enough repetition in music, we tend to start to feel uncomfortable. Now, occasionally, we avoid repetition deliberately just to make the audience feel a little less comfortable. You can think maybe scary movie soundtracks. On the other hand, or the other side of the coin, we have contrast. If there's not enough contrast, then we tend to lose interest. We need variety, we need surprises, we need novelty. In today's music, the chord progression tends to serve as the repetitive element. That is, it provides the consistency and predictability so that the other things around it can be varied and more interesting. Now let's make sure that we understand these two words before we really get started. Now, a chord is really just two or more notes that sound simultaneously, they overlap, and the most common number of notes in a chord is three. So this one gets a special name, it's called a triad. Now, we take chords and we string them together. When we string them together, it's called a progression. This series, or progression, has a very logical feeling of movement. One chord almost feels like it's being magnetically pulled to the next one. This sense of movement towards a final chord or note, usually that final chord is the end of the song, uh, that final chord is called the tonic. And this feels like the most comfortable, stable place we can arrive. It's really the big period at the end of our story that says the end. Now, let's start with some music that we've probably heard before so that we can give a name to a sound that we really already know, the chord progression. Now, the 12-bar blues is one particular kind of chord progression. Now, a bar is usually what pop musicians call a measure. So in this case, we're going to have 12 measures, each one with four beats in it, so it's just in 4-4 four, four meter. And we're going to have a repeating pattern of chords. We're going to have three different chords, as you can see from the chart, and each box is four beats, or one measure. So you'll notice that the one chord actually gets played for four beats four times, so 16 beats of the same chord before we get a change to the number two chord. That one lasts for eight beats, then we come back to home with the one chord again, and then we get a little variety in our last row here frequently, and our two songs are either gonna go a third chord, a second, a first, and then a third again, or they're gonna go third chord, second chord, first, and then first again. Either way, that pattern is gonna repeat really consistently within the song. Now we're going to start with Elvis's version of Hound Dog. Remember, we're going to get our first chord four times. You ain't nothing but a first chord. One more time. And now, second chord. Back to the first. Here's the third. Second. First. And now our pattern repeats. Second chord, back to first, third, second, first. Now our second example of Little Richard's Lucille, this one's really nice because it starts off with the instruments alone playing once all the way through our chord progression. And then Little Richard comes in with the singing, we get exactly the same pattern again and again. Almost all Little Richard songs are 12-bar blues patterns, so he's a great one to maybe see if you can listen to some other songs of his and see if you can hear the pattern there as well. Okay, off we go. Lucille. First chord. Second time. Third time. Fourth time. New chord. And back to our first. A third. Second. First, and in this case, third. Lucy, you won't do your sister's will. Lucy, you won't do your sister's will. You ran out of me, but I love you still. Lucy. 
moving on to even more recent music, the blues chord progression is used a little bit less. We still use the same three chords, the same three harmonies that the blues progression uses, but we end up adding one chord to the set, and then the pattern is simplified, just one measure for each chord. So four chords total, one measure each. And then that pattern repeats over and over again and you sing your pop song. In this YouTube video, this group, The Axis of Awesome, does a really great medley of all the songs that use this same pop music chord progression, which we'll hear a little bit of here. Yeah, we've been a comedy rock band for close to 40 years now, mm. and all that time we've never had a hit. Yeah, and I'll just, yeah but you guys know why. It's why? Because we never wrote a four chord song. What do you, what do you, what's that? What's a four chord song, Benny? Well, if you want to, all the greatest hits from the past 40 years, just use four chords. Same four chords for every song. It's dead simple to write a pop hit. Just four? Yeah, 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 these four. Here. One, two, three, four chords. Sorry, let That's me get this straight, Chicken Little. Um, <laughs> what, you're, um, what you're trying to say is you can, you can take those four chords, repeat them, and pump out every pop song ever. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Just listen. Do you recognise this? Uh, yeah, that is Don't Stop Believing by Journey. That's a great song. Very original There's a few more that fit. Check it out. My life is brilliant. My love is pure. I saw an angel of that I'm sure. Well, that's just two songs that are similar. That's forever not a young. Three I songs. I want to be forever young. I won't hesitate no more, no more. It cannot wait. I'm yours. This is the way you left me. Now let's go back 500 years or so to the infancy of the chord progression. As you can see from this picture, part of our chord progression's development can be attributed to dance. Dancing in the Renaissance had a really important social function. It was kind of like speed dating. It was one of the best times for you to check out a prospective partner in a relatively unsupervised atmosphere. Many Renaissance dances were couples dances, of course, and they were designed so that you would change partners really frequently. Now this presented a problem for musicians because depending on how many dancers you had, you would need to vary the length of your song so that all the dancers could dance with all the prospective partners. Their solution to this was that they would keep the bass line of the music going over and over again, but then leave out the melody and invent new ones on top of that bass line. So they would basically improvise over this repeating bass line. This would allow the musicians to play the music for as long as they needed to without it sounding like a broken record because the same music was happening over and over again. This also gave Renaissance musicians a way to earn notoriety. They kind of derived their street cred from how well they improvised over that bass. That repeating bass was called a ground bass or a basso ostinato, which is basically an obstinate bass because it never quits. This audio example is a bergamasca, a kind of dance, by a group called Ludovico's band. Ludovico was a very famous harpist in the Renaissance, and the album is called The Italian Ground. In the recording, they're doing a recreation of basically what musicians had to do in the Renaissance when they were playing for dance. There's a bass line that keeps repeating, and you'll hear that the musicians above it playing melodies are actually improvising brand new melodies over and over again. And in this case, you actually hear them taking turns a little bit too. Two different musicians taking turns improvising. Now, as we move forward into the Baroque era, about the time from 1600 to about 1750, this dance music got so popular that basically they stopped dancing to it and just sat down and listened. When we do have these dance forms that are really just composed to be listened to, those are called stylized dances. So even though you don't dance, it's still the music that you would have danced to. The bass lines that we used for these dances and the accompanying notes that would go with them became much more consistent. And so we basically got a much more standardized harmonic language, chords, one leading into the next. Often these included the same three chords we heard in our first progression, the blues progression. Now you'd probably recognize some of the Baroque chord progressions, 
but not by name. There were a ton of them, and they have some really strange names like Pasacalia, Chacon, Folia, Pasamezzo, Romanesca, and lots and lots more. But here's a Chacon that I'm betting you'd recognize. This tune by Pachelbel, Canon in D, is a very famous Chacon progression. And then we're going to hear Green Day basically do almost exactly the same one, minus about one chord, but essentially it's the Chacon pattern again in a modern day tune. So here's Canon in D. remind you of a wedding that's a very frequent tune for when the bride is walking up to the altar and now here's green day doing a chacon pattern as well I went to a drink to analyze my dreams she says it's like a sex that's bringing me down I went to a As we move into the classical era, this pendulum starts to swing the other direction. Instead of the chord progression providing a sense of repetition, basically serving as a repeating structure or like a canvas on which we paint, instead they went for a more contrasting feeling. They tended to emphasize how one chord would magnetically move to the next. This often meant just moving back and forth between just two main chords. The first chord being the chord that feels like home called the tonic, the most stable chord in any tune, and the chord that kind of diametrically opposes it, the one that creates the strongest need to resolve to the tonic, a chord we commonly refer to as the dominant. This focus on that magnetic effect between these two chords becomes a guiding principle in many short and large-scale works in this time period. But we're going to focus on just one tiny short example. Because we have one chord that feels stable and one that feels unstable, we can kind of create a sense of narrative, and in this case a sense of a question and then an answer. Ending a musical phrase on the dominant creates this sense that we need to respond or move forward, and it functions a bit like a musical question mark. And then, our second phrase, which will end on the tonic, creates the sense that we've answered the question by creating a sense of resolution, of stability. In this sonata by Haydn, he's going to actually do this a couple of times. Here's our first phrase. That's our question. And answer. And now we hear both question and answer again. As the classical era tended to focus on just two simple harmonies and how they interacted, in order to convey a sense of clarity and balance, the Romantic era sought to do the opposite, to make these harmonic interactions infinitely more subtle. This often meant using a far more varied palette of harmonies and continuing the idea that the chords are there to provide interest and variety and contrast, rather than a repetitive sense of security. This example by Chopin, his prelude in E minor, gives an almost static two-note melody, but each time that simple melody repeats, the chord that supports it is different, which creates a sense of increasing tension, and each time a new, subtle color. As the Romantic era's time of exploration created more and more diverse harmonies, by the time we arrived at the 20th century, just about anything could go. We have music that uses no harmonies at all, or uses harmonies that have no sense of logic or progression whatsoever. 
we also have a return to that most basic idea of the chord progression, especially in pop music, where it really serves as a consistent harmonic palette, like we heard with the Axis of Awesome, on which we create lots of different melodies and tone colors. Okay, that concludes this lecture on harmony and the chord progression.